You don't need to go try to figure out what you're supposed to do. He is your wisdom. You know, when you're worried about life, when you're looking at what your next step is, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. You know, it's like a lot of times we make this separation in our mind about God's here, Christ did something for me, the people that talk about that spirit, is they're a little weird, and I'm just going to do the best I can, right? The door to heaven is open for me, I'm going to walk through it at the end of my life, but for now I'm going to do the best I can. You ever, you ever kind of felt like that's what your Christianity has been reduced to? You know, it's, it's just more active than that. And it's not strange, and it's not weird. It's the life of God that flows from his throne that is in you now because Christ is in you if you've said yes to him. And that life manifests into you as wisdom. There's not one thing that you're facing that God doesn't know how to lead you through it. Amen? Amen. And it's just a matter of acknowledging him, understanding what he did for you understanding who you are in him and trusting that he's good and he will lead you and guide you into truth. Amen. You know, he just will. That's just what he does. It's his nature. It's who he is. He wants to lead you and guide you into the blessing that he's provided for all of those children that are in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. You know, it's, it's what we've been talking about and it's a bit of a tricky subject to, to wade through because when you start looking at the teachings of Jesus and you start maybe reframing what we've kind of been traditionally taught and the reframing is it's not a mixture of old and new covenant it's what do the words of Jesus mean in light of this new covenant and that's what we're looking at right we're not trying to make the Christian life easier we're not trying to you know, present a different God from the old covenant. We're just looking at the words of Jesus. How many of you ever been confused reading the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, you look at Jesus and it's like, pluck my eye out, cut my hand off. Am I supposed to do that? You know, and, and I don't want to make light of it because that's our Lord and our God. That's our, that's our Messiah. That is our Savior, right? I mean, his words are spirit and they are life. His word is commandment. His, everything that he speaks is exactly who God is. But how do you apply his teachings, especially Matthew 5, 6, and 7? How do you look at his teachings on adultery and divorce? Because what he says is even if you've looked at him or her with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. How, do you, how can you live up to that kind of a standard? So to answer that question in light of the new covenant and understanding that Christ is our righteousness and righteousness does not come from the law, we don't throw out the law, we don't try to twist the law or bend the law or twist the words of Jesus, we just look at them from the proper filter, the proper perspective, and that is his finished work. Amen? Amen. That's where we've been. We're on, I think, week five here. You know, we started out by talking about how if you're a sheep, you know God's voice. You know, he didn't say, my sheep know my voice if they quit sinning. My sheep know my voice if they keep all the laws and the commandments. You know what I mean? He said, my sheep know my voice, and there's a period. The issue is, when you don't know that you're a sheep, you're not going to know his voice. And that's so much of what we're doing here is helping you be able to go, meh, Learn that you're a sheep, right? You're a sheep. You are a follower of Jesus. You have been given a new heart. Those laws and commandments that God expects you to live up to, not for righteousness, but to reflect his glory, are encoded into your nature now. Whereas before it was written in stone, now it's who you are. It is who you are to naturally follow God and reflect his glory. Because of what Jesus did, he changed who you are. Amen? Amen? And so that's, the, that's what we do with the teachings of Jesus. We look at them for what they are, apply them for what they are, and let's look at it. So in Matthew 5, verse 17, you know, because there's a, there's a bit of an awakening happening of what righteousness really is and how it comes. 
Righteousness is by faith alone. Romans says it all over, you know, over and over and over. Galatians 3, we're going to get to Galatians 3. But there is a righteousness that is now revealed that is by faith that is apart from the law. And so the question always comes up, well, what are you saying? Are we, you saying that we shouldn't keep the law? Or if you don't, you can just continue in sin? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Let's keep going here. Matthew 5, 17. This is Jesus. So remember, this is after Matthew 4 where he comes out of the temptation in the wilderness, and he begins to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then at the beginning of Matthew 5, he declares blessing for sick people, for poor people, for the downtrodden and the outcast in society. The people that should not be qualified to be blessed under the law, Jesus says, my kingdom is here. You've got to repent. In other words, change the way that you think because... Now people are blessed because they're in my kingdom. And then we contrasted that with Deuteronomy 28 that says, if you keep the law and you keep every commandment and you do it perfectly, then the blessing is upon you. Now, in the kingdom of Jesus, you are most qualified to be blessed when you are the most brokenhearted. You are most qualified to be blessed when you are missing it the most. Why? You don't really need blessing when you're living it all, when you're all right. You need the blessing of the Lord. You need the favor of the Lord. You need the hand of God in your life when you're missing it the most. Does that mean you should miss it so that you can experience a blessing? No, Paul addresses that. Does that mean we should continue in sin there now that we're under grace? and on? No. We're just reframing the conversation from carnal or physical to spiritual. We're looking at ourselves now in light of faith rather than law. So Matthew 5, 17, this is Jesus. After he proclaims blessing, you've got to get the picture. The Pharisees are sitting there, all the lawyers that are kind of the police, the word police over the law to say they know how blessing comes. You keep the law, then you're blessed. Jesus is pronouncing blessing to people who aren't even trying to keep the law. They aren't even qualified to be able to keep the law because they're sick, broke, all the different things. You get the context of who he's speaking to who he's blessing, and then he says this, because you've got to think in their mind, they're sitting there thinking, well, who's this guy proclaiming blessing on this leper over here, or blessing on these people over here? How, who does he think he is blessing these people? This is not the way it works. This is not what Moses taught us. So he responds to them, and he says in Matthew 5, 17, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Say fulfill. That was a good one. 18, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In another area, Jesus says, you know, that he came to finish the work that his father gave him to do. Fulfilling the law, not for, for himself, but for you is part of what he came here to finish. So he says, I didn't come to abolish. We're not throwing it away. I came to fulfill it. Why did he need to fulfill it? What was it even for? So right after that, then he goes through his most famous sermon where he teaches on murder, adultery, divorce, uh, keeping your word, turning the other cheek, loving your enemies, giving to the poor, how to pray, fasting money, worrying, judging others. I mean, he pretty much covers it all in the Sermon on the Mount, right? How many of you ever read Sermon on the Mount and think, I can't do that? Okay? That is by design. That's why he did it that way. See, this is, what, this is how you have to reframe what he's saying. Do we throw out the words of Jesus? No. We understand that he came to fulfill the law. He came to finish the work. And watch. So he teaches the law at not just a, a behavioral perfected obedience level you can make a sentence out of that i don't know what i just said but you know what i mean he shifted it from law to obedience from the heart you've heard it said this but i say this if you've committed adultery i say that even if you've you know lusted in your heart unto temptation you've committed it not even if you've acted on it but if you've even thought about it copy's not here today but we determined that he is a mass murderer because he drives to Atlanta every day and back every day 
and has plenty of time to get angry at all those people driving beside him, right? Nobody, nobody else in here gets mad at the person. I talk to people. Do you talk to people? You roll down the window? Yeah. I had a guy tell me I was number one the other day because I, I was doing the speed limit on Huddleston in Peachtree City, the silliest speed limit anyway. I look in my mirror, and he's riding my tail, and, I'm look, and he sees me looking at him, and there, I'm, oh, I'm number one. Thank you. I like compliments. Yeah. I, I blew him a kiss. <laughs> I did, really. Yeah. Was that too far? No, that's low, huh? Kind of a little smart as a key, maybe. But. <laughs> maybe. 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 So Jesus, <laughs> yeah. Jesus teaches this impossible standard, not just behavior, but your heart has to be obedient. It's not just about not engaging physically in the sin. It's don't go there in your mind and in your heart. Because I say, as the creator, as the one through which God has used to hold all things together, as the very logic of God, as the way God thinks become flesh, that person says, even if it's entered your heart, you're guilty of it. Galatians 3.19. What was he doing when he was teaching that way? Was he teaching an irrelevant message that he thought later on that we would throw out? You know what I mean? Did, was he confused about, no, wait a minute, Jesus, you're supposed to be teaching faith righteousness, right? No, he came to fulfill the work that he gave, that God gave him to do. And what he was doing was this right here, was taking the law to the level that it should have been from the beginning, showed us how to apply it, and then, but this is, this is the context that we have to understand the teachings of Christ. So, Galatians 3.19, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgression. This is kind of a long, long reading here, so keep, keep in mind as we read through this, this is explaining the kind of severity that Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it was because of righteousness until the seed, who's the seed? To whom the promise referred had come, the law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies that one party, but God is one. So is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? See, pull that down just for one second, please. Right now, you've got some pretty popular teachers that are coming out, and they're teaching righteousness well, and they're teaching grace well. But there's almost an antinomian perspective to the law is the ministry of death. And it, Paul does call it that. So, like, let's throw out the law, and it's bad and negative. And it's like, no, the law is perfect. It's holy. It is exactly what God expects of you. So let's not, you know, look down upon the law. Let's just understand what it actually is. So when Jesus teaches a level of impossible living, although... Now that your spirit is within him, now that his spirit is within you, he still expects that level of perfect living. It's just that now as a fulfillment of the, or the establishment of the new covenant, he's not holding your sin against you. Amen? Amen. So watch what, it, so anyway, the teachers that I love some of these teachers that are teaching grace, they're focusing on the new covenant, are, are treading the line of, of confusing people about the law in its proper place because it almost comes across as you know let's let's just throw it away and it's like no you don't throw it away you it's like it's like neo in matrix any matrix who has seen the matrix all three of them man you got to go see that movie anyway it's pretty violent i don't know that i do recommend it But in, in, the, in the third movie, in the third movie, there's a scene where Neo has basically gone into hell, right? He ha and Neo's kind of the savior figure. He's gone into the Matrix, which is an artificial world that the devil has taken over. Let's just call it that. 
And so he figures out that the only way to beat that realm is to fully embrace that realm and fully become all that that realm is and destroy it from the inside. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's not coming in and saying, okay, that was the law, now I'm doing this. He's fully embracing the law. He is becoming the law himself. He is perfectly living out the law and teaching it to the standard that God wanted it taught because he himself is God. But how do we frame all of that? Again, back to this. This is how you frame it. We're not trying to make the Christian life easier Although he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, his teaching, that is what he was referring to. But this is what it makes, this is how it makes sense here. So, verse 21 again, is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not, for if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. 22, but scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, So that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Might be given to those who believe. So righteousness has been given to you because of your faith in Jesus. Verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. Now keep in mind the teachings of Jesus. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. So before the coming of faith, we were under, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until faith that was to come would be revealed. When was that revealed? When, though, specifically? I'll make you think for a minute. Hmm? After the resurrection, right? You see that? This is talking about up until the point of the resurrection, faith was locked up. And you couldn't live by faith because you didn't have God's spirit within you to live from that place of righteousness. We're not throwing out the law. We're understanding its purpose. The purpose was, let's keep going. Verse 24, so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Say this with me. I am justified by faith. I am justified by faith. Verse 25. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Not children of God through obedience. Not children of God through the keeping of the law. Children of God through faith. So then he continues to go through this impossible teaching. Is this, are you, is this good news to you so far? Again, not trying to make it easier, not trying to twist the words of Jesus, just understanding that what Jesus is doing. See, because you get the picture. He shows up and he introduces his kingdom. He invites sick, poor people, people that are unqualified, not because they're poor, but because of where they are in life in relation to the law. These people are not qualified for for Jesus to pronounce these nine blessings on this group of people, yet he does. And it, got, it gets their wheels turning. They're like, well, wait a minute. And this is what it looked like for Paul, too. This is why Paul would say, I'm not saying we should continue in sin. So then he says, listen, guys, I'm not throwing out the law. In fact, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law. In fact, here's what I think about the law. You've heard it said this. I say this. You've heard it said this. I say this. And he goes through a masterful teaching to show them how impossible it is to keep that unto righteousness. He himself was the manifestation of what Paul was talking about, the manifestation of this tutor, the manifestation of this schoolmaster, to show you you need righteousness apart from this law. Are you seeing it? Now, if in your mind you're thinking, well, so where's sin? Well, quit thinking carnally. Think spiritually. Why would you start thinking about sin when you've been told that you are now delivered from the law and you can follow God by faith because you have been made a new creation in him? Why would your mind start going worrying about sin? Get your mind out of the gutter. 
Think spiritually. Amen? Because Amen. that's where people go with it. I'm telling you, that's where people go with it. You start trying to preach this stuff to your friends and your family. They will accuse you of all kinds of things that aren't so nice and make you question what you really know and believe about Scripture. Because you don't want, nobody wants to invalidate the teachings of Jesus. Nobody wants to feel like they're diminishing the words of Christ. But when you understand what he was doing, presenting it at such a level to show the whole world, this is what I think. If you want to live by the law, here we go. Now, I'll get to how this personally applies to your life, but so all of this teaching, this, all of this incredible teaching comes down to Matthew 7, 13. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus, he reshifts the focus back on him because typically Matthew, so let me just read it. Uh, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, if you read this, because Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Beatitudes, that's the Sermon on the Mount, it's the largest recorded sermon that we have of Jesus, it's the hardest teachings that you could possibly try to apply to your life, and he brings it down to this, and it sounds like, if you are still legalistic in your thinking, it sounds like what he's saying is all of that teaching brings you to the conclusion that it's really hard to get saved. There's another place where his disciples said, well, then who can be saved? And he's like, well, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Your salvation is impossible with you, but it's possible with God. So the legalistic perspective reads it and comes down to this and thinks that the narrow road is doing and keeping all of those impossible teachings that he just gave. You see what I'm saying? It's kind of the conclusion that you would come to reading it from a physical perspective rather than a spiritual perspective is to say, okay, you've just taught all these really challenging and difficult things. That's the narrow road. The narrow road are all these really difficult teachings that you've just given. But remember, the law was the schoolmaster, the tutor, to sh until Christ came to show us that we needed a righteousness that we can't live up to on our own. So he can't possibly be referring to the narrow gate is you keeping all of these laws and commandments. The narrow road, the small gate, is he himself. The narrow road, the small gate through which you enter life, is Christ himself, not your accomplishment of all of those impossible teachings that he just gave. Do you see that? I mean, is that good news for you? It's exclusive. Only by him. In fact, John 14, 6. You're tracking with me. You're prophetic and don't even know it. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a different way of what he was saying, the exact same thing he's saying in Matthew 7, 13, the narrow gate. See, what we do as believers, because we value the word of God and because we're such word people, we splice everything out into a bunch of different doctrines. We've got the narrow road doctrine, the small gate doctrine. We've got the nobody comes to God but through Christ doctrine. And it's like these separate things, right? It's saying the same thing. He's the way. He is the... The reason the gate is narrow is because faith in Christ alone as the source of righteousness is hard to receive. Look at the world. Look at Oprah. There can't possibly be one way. You guys ever seen that video? I'm not trying to slam Oprah. But that's the mentality of the world, right? There can't possibly be one way. Well, there is. And it's a narrow road, and it's a small gate, and it is impossible for you to walk through on your own, but with God, it is possible. And I'm not just talking about salvation. I'm talking about you living in blessing in this life, you experiencing abundant life for the purpose of not so you can, you know, drive your Bugatti up your golden driveway into your 10,000 square foot mansion and swim in your large pool and all that. It's for the purpose that God will be glorified. That's why. God has set you free. See, you can't glorify God in the flesh. You can't receive the kingdom in the flesh. 
So God put you in spirit through the working of Christ in you, set you free from an impossible standard of living, and wrote his laws within your heart and said, now you can follow me. Trust me, and I will lead you and guide you. And the fruit will, will be, I will be glorified through you. You just get to enjoy the ride. Does that mean everything's going to be, you know, cupcakes and rainbows? Nope. No. Cupcakes, that's kind of, we should. <laughs> My Little Pony. My Are you a brony? Yeah. Uh, we, we got a brony over here. Again, I'm not, we're not just trying to make it easier, okay? We're not just trying to make it. She's got a brony in her house. That's why she's laughing. Yeah. What's a boy that likes My Little Pony. Oh. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> Is there really? Yes. Wow. Right. I, watched a doc- I watched a documentary on Netflix of, of some of the Native American Indians. We were just down in North Florida, South Georgia, and did some Cumberland Island, Amelia Island stuff, and there was a group of Indians down there, Native Americans, that um, were there for like thousands of years. These guys were like, some of them were almost seven feet tall, and they were all tattooed from head to toe, and then, and then they would use uh, bear grease in their hair, and, and their hair would stand up another foot or so, and these Spaniards, who were, they'd come out, and these things are giants, you know, but those guys, because their ships came in out of the sun through the sea, they embraced them, and it just, they just decimated their, that, that, that particular tribe is completely extinct now, you know. So anyway, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but <laughs> it's interesting. There's a lot of history out there that we don't know about this nation, good and bad, you know. I love reading about all that. Tomo Chichi, we learned about Tomo Chichi in Savannah, the guy that worked with Oglethorpe. It's, we're all talking about it in our house right now, so my son loves that stuff. So back to this, <laughs> because here's what happens. When you start talking about make the distinction between the old and the new covenant, you start talking about it's by grace alone. You start talking about we're not under the law. You get accused of a lot of things, right? You get accused of antinomianism, which is a fancy word for you throwing out the law or you don't understand. You know, the one that I get as a minister, well-meaning ministers will message me well, you need to preach the whole counsel of the word, brother. And it's like, I do. <laughs> the covenant that we're under, I'm preaching that whole counsel. The old one, Paul, man, Paul got angry over and over at the original apostles. Did you know that? Paul and Peter got in a fight in the street in front of everybody because Paul accused Peter of being a legalist, essentially, of acting one way in front of the Jews and one way in front of the Gentiles because he was still trying to keep all the traditions under the law for his Jewish friends, you know. And, and Paul was like, are you kidding me? That's where the, you know, old new wine skin, new wine and old wine skin things come from. You cannot mix the two. You can't mix the old and the new. You are either under one or you're under the other. If you try to put yourself under one law, you're under the entire thing. And somehow that gets jumbled around into people's thinking that you're trying to create a license for sin or you're trying to, you know, wink at God's judgment towards sin or something like that. It's like, no, what I'm trying to get you to realize is that when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it. We have to understand the reality of the complete finished work of the Messiah, the Messiah who was the Lamb of God that because God so desired to have you in his family, sent his lamb here to become your sin for you, to be cursed on your behalf. See, what that means in modern day language is when you miss it, when you keep falling into that sin that makes you feel so guilty and condemned over and over and over and you beat yourself up and then something negative happens in your life, you embrace it because you think God's allowing it in your life because of the way that you've been living. That's the curse, and Jesus became that for you. Do you see what I'm saying? 
your, your wife is diagnosed with a disease and you think, oh, I wonder if God's trying to, what's, what is it that God is doing with this in our life? That's what the curse looks like. You are delivered from the curse of the law. I will put none of these diseases on you as part of the blessing and you are qualified for the blessing. Or you're saying life should just be perfect. I'm saying you should be experiencing the kingdom of heaven here now. Well, if I'm sick and I'm broken, don't worry about all those questions. You know, we, we, we get crazy trying to figure out all those kinds of things. Here's the will of God for you. He created it in the Garden of Eden. What was it like before they ate the fruit? Perfect, right? Perfect. All they had to do was wake up. Everything that they needed was right there. God had already created a system. If they got hungry, you know, they didn't pray, God, will you please send an apple tree? It's like, here's an apple tree right here. Go ahead and have you an apple. Probably fruit on the vine already. If there's not fruit on that one, there's fruit over here. Go get some food off of that one. You know what I mean? It wasn't like God created a complex, difficult system for them to live within. They woke up and everything that they needed was right there. This planet is still like that. And then after, at the end and the final, when everything's all wrapped up, whenever that is and whatever that looks like, it will go back to perfection. You know, this earth will be restored. And there won't be any opportunity for sin to come in at that point because he will have a family that have free, freely chosen him, which he didn't before. I mean, I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, but I'm just trying to touch on some of these areas because it's one thing to teach on a, you know, 3,500-year-old document and put it in place from something that happened 2,000 years ago. But what does that mean for you today? What does it mean for you to be free from the law? In other words, the expectation of living perfect, and if I don't, then I'm cursed, or God's going to allow some kind of judgment, or maybe he, you know what, if you don't give a big enough check today, he's not going to rebuke the devourer on your behalf because you just didn't give quite enough. You, you know, see, that, those are the areas where law thinking continues to creep in, and we still think that there's cursing if you don't live perfectly. No. Sin has its own fruit, which is death. You continue in sin, you're going to experience death because that's the way it works. God, however, has placed his spirit within you as trying to lead you and guide you into all truth, remind you what Jesus taught you, tell you of things to come so that God would be glorified through you. Now, you guys probably already know this stuff, but, but I'm, I'm wanting to build it so consistently in your thinking that you can have these conversations out there. Because I'm telling you, when you start having these conversations about the law being done away with, you are labeled either hyper grace or somebody, they've got all these cute little labels out there for you. It's like, no, you are hyper stupid. You don't understand what Jesus did. If you're worried about me focusing on the finished work of the cross, are you kidding me? Let's keep going. Say, keep going. Keep going. Okay, we'll keep Hebrews 8.13, Hebrews 8.13, just building more perspective here. In that, he says, a new covenant he made, the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away, the law. All right, now let's go to uh, Romans 6. I had a lot of scripture in here. I think we've already got, have we already read a lot of scripture? Is that all of them? Is this the last one, Philip? All right. Romans 6, flip over there with me. Because this is where we are. Romans six fifteen. What then? Shall we sin because we are under the law? Uh, but we are not under the law but under grace? You think it's a good idea? Let me ask you this. Do you now want, now that I've laid out to you that Jesus under this covenant that you're actually in doesn't actually expect you to pluck your eye out or cut off your hand when you sin. Does that mean you now want to run out and sin with your eyes? No. I'm getting some looks. <laughs> Everybody lift up your right hand. Still got it. Still got it. <laughs> that means you're telling me you, either, you don't. Anyway. <laughs> Romans 6.15. 16, 616. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, 
you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. See, obedience is still important. It's just that it's not the context of obedience is not the letter of the law. It's obedience from the heart. It's a choice. It's an obedience. And see, under this new covenant, there is no cursing if you miss it. There's only blessing for you living in Christ. You're free. Now what are you going to do with your freedom? What are you going to do with your freedom? Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that was now claimed that that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. This is where the rubber meets the road right here. Are you still flirting with sin? Or are you, have you fully embraced your new creation identity in Christ that you are a slave to righteousness? Now think about this for a minute because this is where I want to go. This is, this is, you know, it's like sometimes people think that if you fully teach grace, there's no responsibility. There is actually more responsibility living under grace than anything else. Put that last verse up, please, sir. Because what's expected is this, that you are a slave to righteousness. See, we think righteousness is a standard that we have to live up to. Righteousness, first and foremost, means I'm in right standing with God. How do you get in right standing with God? It's a gift that Jesus gives you because of what he's done. Now, Has that gift borne fruit in your life to the degree that it is that righteousness is your master? Or is your fear of finances your master? Is whatever it is you're looking at on the internet your master? Is it whatever it is that you reach for when the stress happens, which one's your master? Which one is it that drives your behavior? So we think master and we think somebody's cracking the whip. You know, it's not that. It's whose teachings are you following? What what naturally comes out of you? See, if you fully embrace that you have been delivered from the curse of the law, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law on your behalf, that he has made you 100% righteous right now, That in this moment, right now, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That should affect your life, right? And the people that say, well, you know, there's got to be fruit, and I'm not sure that you're actually saved unless there's fruit. And say, I get that. I understand what you're saying. I want to take it even higher than that. The fact that you are saved, is it bearing fruit in your life? Because there's the full expectation for you to live that way, not, it's not that God set you free from the law, then he empowers you to keep the law. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you understanding this freedom that you live in. Because constantly we disqualify ourselves. If you think sin disqualifies you from the blessing of God, you don't, you don't really understand what Jesus did. I'm still getting those looks. But I want, you know, I want you to think about how does this make sense in my life? When I'm trying to live and follow God, am I doing it out of a sense of identity or am I doing it out of a sense of obligation? When I'm trying to teach my kids how to live, am I helping them understand who they are and helping them find within themselves the motivation to live this way or am I just giving them the law? That, that's how you really truly understand what a new heart does is you start trying to teach your kids how to live the right way. Because it's easy. You just... <laughs> Why? Because I said so. Now, that's fine. You know, I get that. We're not God. We don't parent perfectly. And I think if we gave our kids as much freedom as God gave us, some of our kids might not be around anymore. <laughs> just, like, just like his kids. You know what I mean? And I'm not attacking parental stuff. It's just a matter of 
you know, it's got to be, it's got to come from within you because you know who you are in him and you're not disqualifying yourself because of your behavior. So God has called you to carry this gospel into the world. Your world, it starts in the mirror, it's in your home, it's on your job, it's wherever else God might call you and lead you and you open your mouth and you start communicating these kinds of ideas. The world doesn't know what Jesus did. The world still thinks that Christianity is about once you stop doing that, then you can be accepted. And it's like, no, he's the only God. There's only one. But as far as teaching, he's the only one in its set of beliefs that reached out to us. I really think that the body of Christ coming from the leaders are afraid to set people free. Afraid to set people free from tithing. I don't teach tithing. You're free from the law of tithing. Did you know that? Whether you give or not, you are blessed because you're in Christ. Now, that blessing should produce generosity because you have value for the message and what's going on and you want to sow into the things that are happening. We, just, uh, we were just able, you guys were just able to sponsor another child in Kenya to go for school for a year. You know, there's always constantly things going on because of your generosity. This week, one family needed help and another family needed help with their power bill. We were able to pay that, like 400 bucks. This person calls, don't even come to church here. We've helped them before. And it's like, you know, we vet those kinds of things. We don't just hand money out. Don't be calling and saying, I need some money. <laughs> we check it out first, you know. But you know what I'm saying? It's because you're not under obligation in anything. And for some reason, people find that dangerous because the mentality then turns into, well, see, because here's what's truly revealed. When you set people truly free, their heart is revealed. You know, there was a pastor that came to my pastor after hearing a message like this, and he said, you know, if I really believed this, you, you wouldn't believe what I would do. If I really believed I was that free, well, you don't know what I would do. That reveals the heart. This heart reveals the message. It, uh, you know what I mean. Right, <laughs> <laughs> message reveals the heart. It does. It really does. And, and, I, and it's not, you know, I hope there's a few things that happen in you is that you breathe a breath of relief. Oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that I fully really embraced what Jesus had done for me. And, and I hope it touches your life when you're sitting there looking at the negative circumstance, trying to figure out exactly what God's doing with it and why it's in your life and how he's using it. Because that's the thing. Well, people say, well, he didn't do it, but he allowed it for this purpose. I, man, I'm telling you, I had a conversation just, just maybe two weeks ago with someone that had cancer and was completely convinced God had given her the cancer because of what she learned when she was going through the cancer. And my question was, could you have learned that without the cancer? I honestly thought she'd say, well, yeah, I could have learned that. She said, no, I would not have learned that without the cancer. I'm like, really? God is that challenged at teaching you that he needs to almost kill you to get you to a place where you will learn something from him. Really? Is, is it his incapacity to teach you? Or is it your hardness of heart that can't receive what he probably had been trying to teach you your whole life? I don't want to be insensitive to, some, to people that are sick. And I'm not saying you're sick because you don't have enough faith. I'm just saying don't mix the two. Don't think that there is an adverse situation in your life that is under the hand of God because of your behavior because everything that God is seeking to do in your life is by grace through faith in spirit, through your life, through your mind and in your heart, God is influencing you because that is the effect of being delivered from the curse of the law. If you think your behavior draws some sense of God creating an adverse situation for you to learn something, you think you are under the law and you think you are experiencing part of the curse of the law. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. That is where you are. If you think that this challenge is in your life because God's doing it to you to teach you a lesson, 
because of associated with your behavior somehow, you're still under the law in your thinking. Have I said it strong enough? Because yep. I want to offend those that still think that God is using hurricanes, tornadoes, and cancer to accomplish his will in the human life. You deserve to be offended because you don't understand the completeness of the sufficiency of the Messiah, the Lamb of God that absorbed his wrath and judgment towards sin. Well, you know, Hurricane Katrina rolled through and that was a manifestation of all that debauchery down there going on. Well, it missed the spot that's really bad, for one thing. <laughs> and it wiped out all the poor people. I think, did he miss? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to attribute that type of stuff to God, you don't understand Jesus, not that element of him. You know, I used to say you don't know him. Those people know him probably, but they don't understand the completeness of his work, the completeness of his sacrifice. I mean, I don't, I don't want to drag it out, but I'm trying to bring it to a place for you where you understand, wow, I, I didn't realize that I was looking at this situation and trying to figure out why God is allowing it. What is it? What is he doing? You know, there's a whole group of people. It's like, God, what are you doing? It's like something happens. God, what are you doing? Well, he's doing Jesus. He's doing what Jesus did for you. He's seeking to accomplish what Jesus paid for in your life. And the way that he does it is by the leading of his spirit. Amen? I got a couple amens. It's important. To focus it on Jesus. You, you need to be at a place where your heart trusts God. Especially when it gets challenging and difficult. You have to be at a place when life gets rough. To not say, I wonder what God's doing. To bless God, I am blessed. I am in Christ. I have been delivered from the power of darkness. Every promise that God has ever made are yes and amen in him. I am daily loaded with benefits. I have the king of glory living within me. He is seeking to glorify himself through me in this moment. This sin that I keep messing with, there's more grace in me that's way more powerful. What am I doing messing around with this stuff? That's where your mind's got to go. God, why are you doing it? Well, he's not doing it, but he's allowing it to happen. Look at Job. Well, Job was wrong. And he admitted it later on. That's a whole other teaching. But it's true. You realize that? Job repent. Because that's what comes up. Well, Job, God did it to Job. Nope. The devil did it. And it wasn't by an invitation from God. God was speaking to protect Job. And then Job later on said, well, you know what? I'd heard about you, but now I know you. I repent from everything he'd said about God. I know that, that I may have just tilted completely too far. <laughs> Again, we're not trying to redefine everything. It's not the point. It's just that we're looking at it through Christ, especially now on this side of the cross, especially now when you go out of here and you see something difficult going on in someone's life You pray the promises of God. You pray according to it is finished. You ever ever wondered how to pray for people? You know, sometimes it's just so challenging and hard and difficult for people. And you think, well, I don't know how to pray, so God must be doing that. Or, you know, are you following me? It's it's challenging for me to understand that perspective because I didn't. I wasn't indoctrinated with those kinds of things. I've never been at a place where I thought that God was allowing the kind of stuff because he needed to teach through challenging circumstances. Now, you put suffering and persecution, all that stuff has its place, but you have to understand God is for you. I want you to remember when you leave 
when you go, when you've got stuff going on this week, you've got things that you're hearing about going on around the world, you've got li when life happens to you, that God is your hope, not your source of confusion. That Jesus really is the source of life that you draw wisdom from. And he doesn't have a thread of, you know, pain and sickness in there for you. He's pure life. He's pure hope. If God had his full will in your life, independent from your choices, your life would look perfect. Come on. It just would. I mean, what does a life look like when God touches it? Deliverance, restoration, peace, <laughs> healing, provision. That's the effects of God. That's where he's trying to lead you. Again, not trying to make it easy, just focusing it on Jesus and what he's done. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for this salvation that you've given us. Jesus, we give you all the glory. We open our hearts and our minds to you, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher. You are the one that puts all these pieces together for us. And in this moment right now, I make myself teachable to you. Just, just take a second. However it works for you, make yourself open to God. You know, it says acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Just in your mind, acknowledge him. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you, giving life to you, seeking to become wisdom for you, seeking to manifest that righteousness, changing your desires, changing your beliefs. God in this moment is breathing grace in your heart to affect how you're going to live your life. Just make yourself open to him. Tell him you trust him. I trust you, Lord. I trust you and I only want to follow you. I want to be a slave to this righteousness that you... I want my natural response to be that of righteousness. That's who I am in spirit. I desire to fully embrace that in every other aspect of my being. We trust you. We thank you for your spirit that you...